Hey everyone, welcome to Office Hours with Cloud Posse, your weekly dose of insider DevOps trends, AWS news, and Terraform insights, all sourced from our sweet ops community, plus a live QA you can't find anywhere else. It's November 27th, 2024. I'm your host, Eric Osterman. Real quick, I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator for AWS infrastructure that helps teams deploy their software faster. And we do this by leveraging our over 200 Terraform modules that have been battle tested and downloaded over 100 million times. So no matter if your team is just getting started or banging your head against the wall with Terraform, just head over to cloudposse.com slash meet. Again, cloudposse.com slash meet. Answer a few quick few quick questions and you'll book a meeting with me directly. So how can you maximize today's session? First off, our format's very informal. You can engage as much as you'd like, ask questions. And if you're curious about any of our open source tools or modules, go for it. And for those on the recording, we host these calls live. Join us by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, cloudposse.com slash office hours. I do have one ask. If you find any portion of this session useful, share it with your team. Just head over to youtube.com slash cloud posse, and uh, you'll find the recording of today's session there in a few hours. So uh, let's get started with some news and announcements for this week. All right. So first uh, big announcement is something I'm excited about. Um, it's while the migration is complete, our mission is far from complete. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So uh, if you've been following Cloud Posse for some time, you're familiar with a different GitHub repo called uh, Cloud Posse uh, Terraform AWS Components. This is a mono repo that we've been maintaining for many, many years. Uh, it has all of these components in here. And we've gone through many, many heated debates inside of Cloud Posse, how to properly version the components in this mono repo. We've riffed on a few of those ideas and ultimately threw in the towel. I think mono repos are great for your company and private software, but I don't think mono repos for distributing components of an architecture indep independently versioned is very practical with GitHub as the distribution source and the features of GitHub. So we bit the bullet uh, with uh, many thanks to a um, one of our customers for sponsoring some of this work, which is creating this um, new GitHub organization managed under the Cloud Posse Enterprise. Uh, has all of those same components uh, migrated at the most recent uh, release. Uh, Igor here on the call has been um, one of the big um, uh, champions of this helping uh, make this happen. So a few things happen now that we've moved everything over into individual repositories under this new organization. So now components are free to vary independent of each other. We can use proper releases, as you see over here, we can start doing breaking changes, uh, following proper semver and continuing to maintain previous releases um, through the use of release branches here. So anytime we cut a new release, major release, there'll always be a release branch so we can continue releasing older versions of that component. We can also leverage GitHub release uh, notes, which are a much more effective way of communicating things like a change log and then aggregate those together. Now, this is not a perfect example of that. This is a very light change log, but as we continue to receive pull requests um, on those, uh, you'll you'll see more thorough um, change logs. The other thing is automated testing. So as part of all of this, uh, we are in uh, going down the path of adding automated testing for all of our Terraform components. For us, components are your Terraform root modules. They compose other Terraform child modules in our uh, open source ecosystem. If you're familiar with Cloud Posse's Terraform modules, all under the Cloud Posse umbrella here. Nothing's changing about uh, these modules here, and they already have terror tests and so forth. These modules are less opinionated. They're uh, intended for everyone to use however you want them to. And then our, um, our components are our opinionated implementations of those modules the way we think of it. So uh, stay tuned for more announcements on the automated testing portions of this. Um, we are uh, making a big pass at that over the coming weeks, ensuring that all the components have tests and that'll ensure that we can accept uh, contributions at a faster clip. Uh, unlike before, 
uh, it was very difficult for us to accept contributions because we didn't know what it was breaking. All right, that was a mouthful. Any questions on this component migration, um, how it impacts you um, or why we're doing it, et cetera? Igor, anything you'd like to add to that? Mm -hmm. So only two things. So the first one, uh, I don't know if you saw it. So today I ran a migration script to preserve history. So that's why we have 622 tags. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> we have a commit related to this component with links to a pull request and we preserve all, all authors. So not, not perfect. We lost kind of some information. We don't have the verified commits, but that's better than nothing. And <clears throat> as really a second, cool. Yeah, so the second thing I'd like to mention is that we also merged today documentation how you can migrate your current components right. to new one. We merged um, component updater GitHub Action uh, to support all of that. Oh, but Igor, we didn't add the link here. That was the thing I wanted, or this hasn't. That's where I will check. Okay. I, I, so I've merged a pull request, but I didn't check that. Uh, it oh, you have, have to cut a release after that. Yeah, it's not released yet. I can cut that now for you. Uh, I didn't know. I'm not so familiar with release engineering for documentation. All right. Sorry we'll, for that. We'll talk about that after uh, Dan cuts that release and share it. Okay, I see. Uh, Daniel, can you handle that today, please? I'm doing it uh, right now, just triggered. It'll take about 12 minutes. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, I've... Uh, merger pull request for component updater, GitHub Action. And when you will run it, it will automatically rewrite your component YAML point to the right uh, component in new organization. So the only thing is uh, components uh, related to space lift and transit gateway. The special case that they will need uh, like a manual um, manual attention. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, uh, yeah, great. Uh, you brought up two things. Let me highlight those as well. So uh, as Igor was saying, uh, if you're using our component updater, it will automatically update the, um, uh, the sources of your components to the new Cloud Posse home. So that minimizes the impact to you. And then you'll see what, if the, there should be no diff other than the change of source of where that component was found. If there is an issue, please go to issues on the component updater and up, uh, and uh, open an issue so we can take a look at that the sooner the better. And the other thing Igor pointed out was, um, this is in the documentation as well that didn't get released, but Dan is fixing that here in a second. Uh, if we go to uh, this issue, which we talked about uh, before, Igor did post, um, you know, if you want to do this manually for some reason, or you can't use the component updater and you want to understand the, relate, the, the logical relationship. So this was the component before, and this is the new home of that component. So this is the full mapping. And for the most part, it follows a very logical pattern. Um, there were two or three exceptions uh, that I think Igor broke up, uh, or not didn't broke, broke up, <clears throat> brought it up. Well. So um, I'm this sorry that here, I right. grabbed you. We have uh, a couple components that were renamed. For example, uh, our SSSO renamed to Identity Center. Um, and Argus CD repo renamed to Argus CD GitHub repo. Um, probably that is, but <clears throat> what what I when I mentioned space lift and transit gateway, so the case it was delivered uh, like a like a single component uh, and in uh, in components YAML it will it reference 
it used to reference to just a space lift or to just transit gateway and pull all of components. Now we split them into a multiple. So uh, you will have to, to manually split and create a two, three components YAML for each of them. So that's a bit different scene, but 95% of components are strict one-to-one -one and very easy to to follow the rules of how wow. the name changed. Any questions on this? All right. Next announcement is that's my slides here. All right. Uh, this one uh, caught me off guard. Um, AWS Copilot, uh, which is not to be confused with GitHub Copilot or any other Copilot, was Amazon's. Um, that's where I'm, you know, the the valiant effort at creating a better ECS experience that really felt a little bit more Heroku like, but had uh, the configurability uh, of everything you can do on ECS. Uh, they've invested a lot in this uh, CLI. Uh, giving it a very nice uh, homepage and documentation. Um, you know, I like this documentation a lot more than I like the AWS CLI documentation. It, let me just put it that way. Um, we have we brought it up many times on office hours um, as an interesting approach to how to approach ECS. I'll be honest, Cloud Posse, we didn't get a chance to adopt it. Uh, we're still, you know, uh, using Terraform for ECS predominantly uh, and another tool called Espresso. Uh, to deploy to or update ECS task definitions. But this has always been on the radar as something I want to find out how to integrate it with everything else we do, because I think this uh, is a better developer experience than just using raw Terraform. Unfortunately, uh, what's become evident um, through some sleuthing is uh, this project is on life support. So uh, what was weird was uh, earlier this week, um, there was a, oops, I clicked the, oh, I clicked the wrong one. Is Copilot uh, still maintain this one? So there was a post that was uh, taken down and that post was announced um, in uh, this commit. And you can see what the original announcement was basically that uh, we announced here and end, end of support uh, for the Copilot CLI. And then um, it was uh, reverted in uh, the next PR here in 75. Um, but there was actually a GitHub discussion on this whole topic that hasn't been taken down. And they're basically saying that they're not um, doing any more uh, investment into this Copilot. We are not actively developing any new features for Copilot, but still do some maintenance work. So uh, this is eerily reminiscent of two other projects that I was uh, following. So Fargate Cly, I actually used um, back in the day. Now you can see that was an eternity ago in uh, DevOps years, so that was four or five years ago. That Cly showed what it could really be like uh, using um, ECS as a Heroku alternative. That project was abandoned and then ECS Cly uh, came out and then that project was abandoned. Uh, also, this is, you know, the AWS's main org while the Fargate CLI was in the labs and Copilot is in the main org as well. So ECS CLIs do not have a good track record at AWS. Anyone have thoughts or insights on this one? My, my only um, quick thought on it is uh, the fact that they had an announcement saying that they were end of lifeing it, and mm -hmm. they pulled it back, and then they just then they kind of gave a a vague answer. Um, I'm wondering if there's some sort of timing issue where they are going to release something at reInvent uh, 
that supersedes this or makes this yeah. not necessary, but someone inadvertently jumped the gun with the announcements on the tool that it will be um, that yeah. that will be superseded by it. Um, that that's what it looked like to me because they you, you don't generally you don't you don't generally see this kind of like weird behavior from Amazon and this kind of stuff. Usually they're yeah. pretty, pretty well coordinated on when they're going to end of life something. Um, that that was the only I mean pure speculation on my part, but that was the only thing yeah. that kind of came to mind. It makes a lot of sense since reInvent starts next week. Yeah, it, it's it's really the timing of it also led, yeah. led me to believe that that might be the case. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Any other uh, thoughts on this one? Okay. Next announcement is part of the whole uh, AWS reInvent uh, announcement pollution you'll be encountering over the next week or so. Uh, drown you're, You'll be drowned out in announcements from AWS, just showing just what enormous organization it is. Uh, but uh, this was one that stood out. I think everyone who's worked with AOBs um, over the years has wanted this for one reason or another. Uh, if for no other reason than just setting your cross-site uh, scripting uh, cookies uh, and so forth. So uh, I think it was Michael uh, Rosenfeld that brought this to my attention. So thanks. Um, excited for this. announcement was just just while well, i'll chime in because i don't think it's on the list there the other thing i saw um that i thought was interesting in kind of the http ish uh, world is that um cloud front distributions now support grpc oh wow you know, which is interesting so yeah i did miss that one yeah i i didn't send it to you either and uh but i remember reading it like last week i think sometime um, to be clear, though, uh, gRPC is not really a cacheable protocol, is it, over HTTP? So this would be more pass-through? Um, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. I, I guess, in theory, you could cache responses just like anything else. I mean, it's just another protocol, right? Like, yeah. so with protobufs and everything. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly how it all works, but I did... I did see the headline. Yeah, interesting. Uh, and yeah, these are a little bit out of order here. So um, I'll just keep going down so I don't miss anything, but I have more yeah. uh, like free reinvent announcements coming up. There's the announcement in the um, in chat if anyone's interested, I just found it. Cool. Uh, the next one um, uh, strikes close to home not directly in that uh, you know we're affected by by this brouhaha, but uh, you know I've always been wondering when or if uh, HashiCorp might pull this trump card out uh, with Terraform um, in light of all the open tofu things, and and referring to things uh, by the Terraform uh, trademark. So Redis has uh, flexed apparently um, and reached out to the maintainers of uh, Redis uh, Rust library and wanted to either take over it or have them rename their um, project. Uh, there's concerns, obviously, about that because if anybody's using that, it's going to change the functionality. Then again, it is their trademark. They should have rights to that. I don't know what the right answer is. Um, thoughts on this, anyone? I also wondered if, you know, the fact that it was under a permissive license previously, but I, I don't think that it grants automatically any, you know, rights to uh, using trademarks, but I think yeah. system. I'm sure that the previous license explicitly continued to protect their trademarks uh, in, yeah. in there and against unauthorized use. So, yeah, that's an interesting one. I don't know. All, all these examples of this stuff happening is just going to continue to erode people's trust in using open source software, which really sucks. Yeah, it really does. 
We don't want to get back to the world of shareware. Next announcement. Uh, this one is uh, a cloud posse announcement. So many thanks to Mike uh, Rosenfeld for submitting this PR. Uh, it's something we need a long, 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 long time ago. And I'm embarrassed uh, that we haven't had it until now, but it is uh, this along with other list commands is a priority in Atmos to make it easier to understand kind of the data model. Uh, we've always supported these described commands in Atmos, which uh, shows the full like deep merge uh, data model in memory as JSON, but that's not always user-friendly unless you're trying to script something. So with this approach, you can now very easily list uh, all of your stacks, uh, list all of your, all of your components. And, and we're going to start doing this for every type of object that we have, making it easy to list what you have and making that view customizable. But that will be coming in a subsequent uh, pull request. Uh, so that was released as well. Let's go down here. That was released in uh, 1.110 of Atmos. Also, uh, yeah, uh, this we we've been using a lot of um, uh, Code Rabbit in all of these reviews, and I'm really happy with uh, the suggestions that it's finding. Sometimes they're not appropriate for the pull request. One thing that I thought was really cool that I just saw in this pull request—I don't know if I can find an example of it right away—was Code Rabbit can also create an issue for it. Like if you don't want to do it in this pull request, you can ask Code Rabbit just to create an issue for you so you can get back to it later on. So otherwise it felt kind of like, oh, this is a good suggestion. I want to do it, but I don't have time to do it in this pull request. So just by having that, that opportunity for it to create an issue for you, uh, no changes, no suggestion gets left behind. I don't know where it was, but it wasn't one of these PR somewhere. All right. Any questions on that before we move on? All right. So um, in uh, perusing Helm file, I uh, noticed something interesting. It was a link to this uh, guru base. Never heard of it before. Um, the name doesn't really roll off the tongue for me, but it is cool what they've done. They've created basically LLMs for every uh, you know major open source project here. I can't figure out how to submit a project to this. Uh, I wanna do that maybe for Atmos, um, but I got pretty good answers um, asking Helm file, you know, uh, how to create a config for multiple environment, oops, environments. Um, and then it works uh, just like the normal chat GPT you're familiar with. Well, I'm sure there are ways you can uh, trick it up, but um, I liked it, especially that you can uh, e ingest it based on the GitHub repository and that, that project's um, documentation. Had, had anyone seen this guru base before? It was the first I heard of it. This one here is specific to Helm file, and then all the other ones in the sidebar there, they're all different gurus. Different. Yep. Yeah, right. Exactly. I think uh, just gurubase.io um, directly, I think, has all the, it is like the canonical site for all this stuff. Gurubase.io? Yeah, I think that's yeah. where you, yeah, that's where you yeah. end up there. Yep. Yeah, you can presumably ask all of them. Quite a lot of projects, but I it what it really is is a um an interesting way of kind of showcasing. I think Guru Base is a enterprise LLM software that you can install at your company. Uh, and this is a way of them showcasing the tech uh, leveraging open source projects. It'd be interesting to see if there's a like you know uh, Helm file guru versus raw chat GPT. See if there's right. a difference, you know, in quality of answer yeah. kind of thing. Or... Yeah. I agree. 
All right, next announcement. Yep, oh, I close that tab. Uh, this one, I think it was you, Matt, who shared it with me. Um, Aurora Serverless V2 now supports scaling to zero. Uh, that's kind of cool, especially for your you know, dev environments, possibly, or databases that um, are mostly associated with cron jobs um, that run periodically. You can scale those down now to zero. Yeah, or, you know, um, things that just happen to be like, you know, only available during office hours or, you know, that kind of, or, right. you know, business hours, uh, et cetera. But um, at least it's an option now where it will automatically support. Well, it will support, it has a setting now to automatically scale itself to zero. So you don't even have to manually scale it to zero. So you can tell it when it has no traffic to scale to zero. And it supports both the Postgres and MySQL out of the box. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. All right. This was a article trending on Hacker News uh, this week, you know, uh, related to a lot of the people on this call. If you're ever on call, curious what your schedules are. Um, are they typically running a full week? Do you start them on Mondays or do you stop start them kind of midweek? The argument here is they should be started midweek, especially in the U.S. You know, we have a lot of three day holidays and that keeps it kind of more fair. And also, if there are any incidents over the weekend, this helps you. Um, you know, on Monday, log those tasks and get uh, work started on those. Next announcement was back to reinvent, uh, re reinvent announcements. Um, as we saw earlier this year, uh, they added the abil ability for conditional uh, rights. Uh, this is um, expanding on that support, uh, allowing you to have a policy requiring uh, that you check an object exists before writing it. And then related to that was another one where you, uh, I believe, uh, previously, the uh, functionality could only check for the existence of the object. Now you can check uh, that um, the object was is unmodified before updating it. So basically, um, that the SHA, if you will, of the object or the version of the object is the same before you go to write, knowing that so that so that you know that there were no other writers at the same time. And as we've talked about, this is kind of cool for uh, S3 the backends on AWS. Um, the, co uh, the combination of these uh, capabilities mean soon you don't need to have the uh, DynamoDB anymore uh, to use S3 as a backend. This is cool. This is going to be similar to Azure buckets, by the way, because an Azure backend, you don't need like a uh, yeah. full handle, but okay, that's cool. Exactly. So um, Amazon S3 is a little bit behind the curve uh, in terms of some of this functionality. Uh, so yeah. they're playing catch up. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, they're playing catch up because they were the pioneers, right? In this one, like everyone else got to see what they did first. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. Copy them and then Take a move right add on top of that. Yeah, <laughs> so... And I wonder what the sheer scale of Amazon S3 is relative to the competitors. It's got to be like an order of magnitude or more. Uh, I mean, it's probably an order of magnitude greater just because Amazon uses it. <laughs> like, like no joke. <laughs> like on right. top of all the stuff that they they actually store for like the Amazon e-commerce side of things has got to be gigantic. Like you know, petabytes and petabytes of data. Yeah. Um, another announcement is uh, follow-up. Uh, we've talked about the alpha releases of HashiCorp uh, BSL, BSL license Terraform coming out with um, ephemeral resources. That has now uh, been officially released. This is a nice write-up talking about um, how those are, how you use those ephemeral um, resources. 
The key thing about ephemeral resources is that they're not persisted in the Terraform state, uh, which has been a request for a long time because the state can sometimes contain secrets. I'm not uh, too yet uh, versed on uh, technical details here, but that is that what this means though is especially as you see it's been implemented. Um, you know, if that is used in a Terraform module, that module is now broken in OpenTofu until OpenTofu implements comparable support or can gracefully degrade, which is interesting. I haven't seen any mention of that. Maybe that's a trade-off that OpenTofu can make initially is gracefully degrade in certain ways like this with a warning. I don't know what users would want. It's interesting though, the like the core internals of of terraform like this the data like data resource and you know provider and everything are actually defined like their their interface definitions and everything are actually in the sdk mm -hmm. um so presumably this would be available to open tofu like in the sdk like they don't need their own version of it right because right. Like, yeah, exactly. So if the it, well, yeah. So the providers are going to be compatible, aren't affected by the license changes anywhere. So, oh, in the plugin SDK, to your point, yeah, yeah. is yeah. is the thing that defines that there is a yeah. a data a data source or a resource yeah. or now presumably like locals presumably ephemeral will now exist in that. I haven't actually looked at it, but yeah. presumably that's where they define this thing. So all they'll need to do is hopefully upgrade their their you know resource and be done with it cuz and all the internals of the providers basically use the provider sdk or the plugin sdk yeah yeah and this is mpl license still yeah yeah it has to be or else the none of the providers could use it mhm mm I just wonder if that latest version is the thing that implemented like ephemeral or just search for that maybe somewhere in there. Yep. Yeah. So that makes sense. Cool. Any questions on this before we move on? And the last one was just something that caught my eye. Uh, I was trending in uh, Reddit for Kubernetes, which was a plugin for Helm using the common expression language, um, which I hadn't seen before. Think of it like an alternative to a JSON schema for validating your values. .yaml in an expressive way that's uh, clear. So. If, you have, if you're not familiar with Helm, uh, it's very pluggable. They they follow a, a um, pattern similar to what GitHub uses, the GitHub or the Git CLI uses rather, um, to uh, make it pluggable. I think they call it a porcelain API. So your plugins can be written in any language. And then when you run the Git CLI command, you can actually see them in the help. So that's cool. Has anyone used Cell before? I've never seen it before. All right, that's the end of my announcements. Anything else uh, catch your eye uh, this past week for the pre-reinvent announcements or otherwise? All right, well, uh, let's do our- I... oh, go on. Oh, oh, sorry, I was gonna say, I, I had one that I found, I was trying to find the link to it so I could, I could send it here that, uh, one of the announcements talked about an enhanced um, UI experience that mm. uh, that they were bringing to the console, which included like a security score um, and some other things to to there. And I mean, while that announcement was just, I mean, it was whatever. Like, uh, um, it seemed interesting. But what what it what I found in there is that um, I never realized this is that there's actually a whole design system. Um, that AWS has published, like in all their all their UIs are built on top of, 
where they've released all of their component, their React components, basically, as open source and and a bunch of other things. So I just dropped the link for that right there in the uh, in the chat. I thought it was interesting. I, I'm not particularly the biggest fan of um, AWS's look and feel and and how they do all this, but um, as far as how you would release a design system and document it and give examples, I thought that this website was uh, was actually awesome. Like how the whole thing that worked. Really cool. Yeah, and they have lots of. Um, they have lots of examples and you can go into each component and toggle like light mode and dark mode and sample data and use it and every possible thing. So, you know, it's a lot like, like storybook. If you're a web developer out there, like storybook gives you kind of the, the same functionality, but this is, um, this is a much prettier, uh, version of that. Um, and it also shows you how, um, if you dig into the source code of some of these components, like, some of the best practices that you can think of around like um, accessibility and um, responsive design and some other things that, uh, that that AWS has clearly spent, you know, a ton of time on making it work. So just an interesting project to, you know, uh, go on a deep dive on if you, you know, you, you just want to geek out on it for a little while. I'm not the biggest fan of the look and feel, but I thought the overall that the um, the, the project was well done. Very cool. All right, and uh, Dan just shared that we did a, that release for our documentation on the component upgrading path is now live. And uh, you can learn more how to update uh, by following this guide here, which is the manual way of doing it. All right, so uh, that brings us to the Q&A portion of our office hours. Um, any uh, questions we can get answered today? I had one that I just posted to the office hours channel uh, earlier. Um, and I I have something we could discuss too um, if we, we run out of things. Um, but yeah. Um, Really, I, I'm wondering what people use uh, for static analysis on Terraform, uh, like what actually provides value. I think we've used a number of different things and we've kind of uh, narrowed in on just being using TFLint uh, and Trivi. Uh, those those two tools like kind of um, at a baseline, they can give us some good security heads up and they can uh, tell us to conform to like pretty standard conventions. Um, but if anybody has any other static analysis tools, I'd be interested. Yeah, I followed this message as well because I was curious to see what uh, the recommendations would be. And somebody recommended a number of security tools. And I mean, I think that there's like half a dozen uh, yeah. security security linters. Uh, yeah, check all the TFSec and TerraScanner are the ones uh, that usually come up. TFSec, I think, is what is built into Trivi uh, because Trivi is made by Aqua Security and so is yeah. TFSec, I believe. Um, but yeah, uh, and and maybe there there isn't more, right? Linting and kind of security checks for infrastructure as code feels like, you know, you're covering a lot of the big, um, you're covering a lot of the your bases there. Um, but if anybody had anything that came to mind, I'm, I'm just like kind of gathering research right now. Yeah, I guess the only other thing I would mention is that um, uh, Sneak or Snick or however the heck you pronounce that, that S-N-Y-K mm -hmm. company has been in the game for a long time. And I believe that they have an official partnership with HashiCorp. Like that's actually um, how um, TF Cloud, or not TF, but Terraform Cloud actually does their um, they're scanning uh, all oh, really? that stuff. So yeah. So um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I'll, um, worth, worth I don't looking think that at... one's free, but I it's should not. look into it again. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. Um, it works yeah. well from what I've what I've heard. Like I've I've used it for non Terraform things on a lot of stuff, and it worked really well. Um, I have a couple of friends that are using it for Terraform and have good things to say about it. I've just never had the chance to to try it. Cool. Yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing it up.
It's interesting that they have issues disabled on this repository. Um, Were they saying to migrate to TF to Trivi? Is it because it's like no longer? So I TF say I remember seeing at some point an announcement. Or maybe they've just decided to move to discussions, which is an interesting idea. I mean, issues are a little bit redundant with discussions, depending on how you look at it. TFSec is joining the Trivi family makes me think that it's maybe like... Yeah, yeah. Is, it, is it under Trivi now? Maybe there's... Yeah. Like maybe they, they're they migrating it. Yeah. I think it is. I think I heard something about that a while back um, when I was working with the stuff. Yeah. On a I thought so, that, yeah. this, this, that this was now, I thought there was even an announcement in the repo, but I could be thinking of another project then. Let's see here. Trivi is still pinned. Oh, no, Trivi is pinned. So that's probably the one then. Yeah. Makes right. sense. Trivi does a lot. It's not just I yeah. see. It's all the things kind of. Mm -hmm. It'll look for secrets and stuff. Um, But yeah, cool. Also, uh, Pepe, are you here? He said he might not make it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I don't think I can add too much more uh, to your question. You had a question for office hours that we briefly touched on, which was um, about monorepo releases and if we ever found a solution for like versioning independent services or components within a monorepo like that. Um, and uh, yeah, the TLDR on that that I shared was we didn't, and we decided to move everything to uh, individually versioned repositories. Uh, if you have a monorepo, I think the approach is similar to what maybe Alex Atkinson was talking about, which is you, you need a version file in each one of your components. You need some checks around that to make sure it's always updated if the files within that path are updated. And then you need an artifact storage. You can't use the GitHub repository itself very conveniently if you're also going to use it at, at, for this mono repo and versioning. So if you push an artifact like to um, ECR or if you push it to Artifactory or S3 or something, something else that uh, keeps track of those. But now you have this other system that you got to track for that. I think that works therefore in a private uh, enterprise, but it's a little more cumbersome, I think, in the GitHub landscape. So by having, uh, by using GitHub re repositories themselves also as the store of the artifact, it's all self-contained and I like that. Yeah, I'll just add that I, I recently um, also had this conversation with a customer and the only tool set that I found that at enterprise scale that can kind of handle this really well um, is Basil like the open source monorepo tool from um, you know that that originated in, in Google? Um, learning curve is extremely extremely steep to learn it, but once you do learn it, um, you can do almost anything with you know with any with any um, technology out there that exists. So it has lots of abilities to like deal with. Um, change detection, um, independent versioning, building artifacts, publishing artifacts, like doing all those things. And there, there are a couple of like community plugins for Terraform in there. I haven't had a chance to actually try to mm. um, try to go like do this, but maybe uh, maybe as we get closer to the holidays and I take some time off and I and I have nothing to do, I uh, maybe I'll kick the tires on this and. Um, you know, and, and try to see if I could put together a proof of concept on using it. So, yeah, All but right. it gives you it gives you the ability to define like a you know a proper um, dependency chain and all of that kind of thing. So if you change files in you know in one place, it knows to rebuild all the other ones and you know do a bunch of other things. So it's pretty it's pretty smart uh, in its tooling. It's just very uh, I don't know. I usually pick up technologies really quickly, and that one in particular felt very difficult for me to to kind of grok uh, all the ins and outs of it. But once I did, um, it seemed pretty good. I I used it for like um, for writing like tools in in other languages, not in Terraform. So.
which is predominantly what it was geared towards, probably. Yeah, yeah. And there were like for ex Googlers that started the project. Yeah. And I was writing stuff in like, you know, Java and C at the time. And um they they have lots of cookbook and type examples for those, you know, those technologies in particular. So yeah. All right. Uh Matt, I think you said you had some other other topics, maybe, or was somebody else jumping One in? One thing. Sorry, one thing for Pepe, uh, in case he does watch this recording, is uh, Alex uh, Atkinson uh, mentioned his project GitOps automatic versioning uh, in the chat, which mm. seems like it's built for monorepos and managing directories. Um, so that might be something he's Pepe should look into. Oh, sorry, uh, Alex, I didn't mean to brush over that. <laughs> Thanks for calling that out. I have a question if, um, if there's no other <clears throat> yeah, go for it. questions pending. Um, and it's not Terraform specific, so you can tell me to, you know, bring it into to a different forum. Um, but I think it'll intrigue people. Um, we recently had a, uh, a migration away from AWS classic load balancers to uh, application load balancers. Um, and um, to our surprise, uh, that caused a lot of 502 errors. And uh, we're still puzzled as to why that is. Um, you know, we checked everything, configuration settings, you know. Um, the the 502 errors were intermittent. Uh, so only maybe, I don't know, 25 to, to 30 percent of requests would hit 502 errors. The one thing that we noticed was uh, much higher latency. Uh, on the ALB than on the, the classic, uh, classic, you know, responses would come back in, I don't know, a, a millisecond or 10 milliseconds. I can't remember the number now. Um, whereas it would be like around uh, five to 10 seconds for the ALB. And- uh, uh, On seconds? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, is, it is really bizarre. And it's, it's um, so we're still kind of scratching our heads and looking at various you know, explanations. And in the meantime, we have to use NLBs uh, instead of uh, application load balancers. Um, and, and that's okay, but it, it would, I, I'm just really puzzled as, and, and wondering if anyone else has any ideas uh, of things we could look at that could explain this. Um, did you open up an AWS support issue on it? Yeah, we did actually. And they didn't really have much to say. They, they were saying this is application side so, you know, we need to get more data on that, but I, I just can't think of how changing something in front of the application could, you know, could cause that um, increase. We, we figure it's the increased latency. Um, it's not necessarily the, the increased latency might be a symptom more than, you know, uh, a, a direct indication of, of, of cause. So. Yeah, so I don't know if anyone has any ideas that would be really appreciated. <laughs> hmm. It's a really puzzling one, so. Not off the top of my head. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the only thing that comes to mind is maybe there's something happening with headers um, in the ALB versus what what was in the classic load balancer. And that, that's like, what I thought too at some point. But go ahead, yeah. Can, yeah, can and share. I was just gonna say somehow that's causing your application to behave differently. Uh, mm -hmm. the first thing I would do is crank up your um your logging all the way on the ALBs and then go look at the actual request logs and see it will actually show you all the headers that, that are being passed through and their values and um it will show you all the metrics of like um request time response time um from from both the client perspective as well as the upstream like server perspective and then maybe those things will help you kind of narrow down as to where you know wh where it might be coming from yeah 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 one one hypothesis that i had was that uh maybe the like you know in the classic lb all the headers would just go through uh invisibly um whereas in the lb i thought maybe it's Maybe it's stripping some headers, um, but the Amazon guy said no. Everything just 
goes through. If, if anything, it sometimes it adds headers. But yeah, I guess that, that, that was be... actually what my thought was, is that it's adding something that your server is choking on. Right. What about right. So classic ELBs? I don't believe supported keep alives and ALBs no. do. And client and maybe 30% of your clients are sending a keep alive header, for example. Um, and then uh, instead, and with a keep alive, I believe the requests are now continuously going to the same server. So then uh, that server could be more loaded than other servers. So they're actually getting a degraded experience. So you might want to disable, you could try disabling keep alives. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. I'm just curious to, for this. What, what are the backend servers that are you're talking to? Is it like... Uh, there are EC2 instances running Docker containers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'm wondering if, if one of the other things might be that you, um, you in the ALB configuration, th this has nothing to do with the, what the back end is, but another thing that popped into my head is uh, in your um, ALB configuration, I wonder if the health checks um, maybe aren't, configured properly so you're constantly getting um getting targets that are being marked healthy and then marked unhealthy and then healthy and then unhealthy yeah and then, then that's why you're getting the 502s because 502 is legitimately saying the gateway is not available meaning that the upstream right. server that it's trying to send it to um isn't available to process the request so i wonder if there's some sort of like bouncing going on there with the the health check yeah, we, we looked at the health check carefully for that exact reason. Um, the ALB doesn't allow us to, like, I think the minimum, you know, health check uh, period and whatever there is like, you know, two seconds or five seconds, something like that. And we, we, we figure indeed the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the AC2 instance should be marked as unhealthy for shorter periods of time, but yeah, we, we, we couldn't like we, we basically made the health check as fast as we could and that didn't help at all. Um, so the LB doesn't doesn't support faster uh, health checks than, than we you know than than than, uh, than we did. Um, and and I, I'd say that even even if we did do that, that would, that would seem more like a um, well, what is causing the instance to not, you know, to be busy processing something to the extent that it, it appears healthy to the, the load balancer, but actually isn't, right? Like its connections are maxed out or something. Um, so something is going on on that machine. And so I, I think those are two good ideas that, that I'll re-explore the, the keep lives and the headers, have another look at, the, at, at those. All right. Um, we're all, we're uh, we got about six more minutes. Thanks, right. guys. Thanks, Oliver. Matt, is that enough time to go over uh, your other question or discussion topic, or do you want to save that for another time? Uh, it was just, um, and you folks very possibly likely already talked about it. Um, but did you happen to pick up that Martin Atkins uh, joined the Open Tofu team? Oh yeah, yeah for sure. Oh. Uh, okay, we, okay. Uh, really? Like, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, really yeah it's an interesting topic. discussion topic so if it wasn't talked before i wanted to make sure it got thrown in the thrown in the mix but yeah if you've already chatted about it then I'll, i need to go and catch up on some videos because i'd be interested in what y'all's thoughts were um but that's a cool one yeah but so is, what is that as an employee like uh, i don't i don't remember what the how was open to infrastructure yeah so space yeah. Lit, martin atkins. oh i see no yeah or no martin atkins Rather, and um, he is uh, full time on the Open Tofu project. Good. So, if anybody's unfamiliar, he's uh, one of the top contributors to Terraform Core, or at least always answering questions in GitHub issues there, as well as uh, an active um, participant in the HangOps uh, Slack community, uh, answering questions there. Yeah. Um, just mentioned apparently Mart was is his uh, GitHub yeah. uh, is his GitHub handle. So if you don't recognize the name, but recognize right. the GitHub handle, he, he's the guy. Yeah. So, yep, very cool. Um, also, uh, Matt uh, Gary, you uh, 
just had your talk at uh, KubeCon, I think. Uh, was it talking about an open tofu migration? Yeah, um, migrating one of our customers over. Uh, it's just a good success story. Uh, I posted it in the Open Tofu channel uh, cool. for anybody who's interested. But yeah, that was a good one. Um, hoping to do another uh, Open Tofu Day talk for KubeCon Europe. So we'll be submitting to that soon. Yeah, and you're headed to reInvent uh, on Monday? Yeah, um, my schedule is insane and we just signed another client who starts on monday so i think it's going to be a right. fun week for me uh yeah uh we'll see how it goes um but yeah if anybody's gonna be at reinvent uh get in touch yeah all right thanks everyone for your time uh today we'll be back next week same time same place we'll be posting a recording of this session to our youtube channel go to youtube.com slash cloud posse to find that as well as our back catalog of all the past episodes if you're interested in seeing if Cloud Posse can help you at your company, uh, go to cloudposse.com slash meet. Again, cloudposse.com slash meet, and you'll book a meeting with me directly. Uh, if you uh, listen to podcasts, we syndicate the office hours as a podcast as well. So go to podcasts.cloudposse.com uh, for all the past episodes there. And uh, you can always register for our newsletter. Go to newsletter.cloudposse.com and uh, sign up. Thanks, everyone, again. See you next week. Have a great uh, Thanksgiving in, if you're in the U.S. and talk to you uh, later. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thanks.